Uh, my name is Eric. I'm the president of Georgetown Law Students or Democratic Reform. Sorry. Uh, we're excited to be hosting this debate with the Georgetown Federalist Society on a very critical topic, how we elect U.S. presidents. And I'm going to let our expert speakers tell you a lot more about that, but I just wanted to briefly introduce our moderator, Professor Paul Smith. Uh, he is a resident election law expert here at Georgetown, distinguished career in appellate practice, numerous election law cases at the Supreme Court. Most of which I lost. <laughs> um, including the recent uh, Wisconsin jurisdiction <coughs> case that just last fall, you probably heard about. Uh, he's the VP for litigation strategy at the Campaign Legal Center, and we're very happy to have him here. So uh, please give him and our debaters a round of applause, and let's get started. Thank you, Eric. Um, let me introduce our speakers uh, briefly. We're really lucky to have both of them here. Uh, to, my, to the fur further left, Congressman Jamie Raskin of the uh, 8th District in Maryland. Uh, he was elected to the House in 2016, so he's kind of new. Uh, previously served three terms as state senator uh, in the Maryland General Assembly, where he was also the Senate Majority Whip. And for more than 25 years, Congressman Raskin has also been a professor of constitutional law at American University, Washington Co College of Law. And he is a longtime advocate for electoral and campaign finance reform. Uh, including having served on the Board of Fair Vote and is a, a strong supporter of the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, which we're going to hear more about in this conversation. Uh, Trent England is the Executive Vice President at the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs, a state-based public policy research organization that analyzes issues from the perspective of limited government, individual liberty, and free market economy. Uh, Mr. England directs both the Center for the Constitution and Freedom and the Save Our States Project. Uh, he is also the David and Ann Brown Distinguished Fellow for the Advancement of Liberty, as well as an ad adjunct fellow uh, of the Freedom Foundation, and he is a strong supporter of the Electoral College, which is why he's here. Um, so let me start things off um, uh, with the congressman, since he's a congressman, you know. Um, we've had the Electoral College, uh, Congressman, for now 229 years or whatever it may be, uh, and... Uh, <coughs> What's so bad about it? Why should we do something about it? <clears throat> well, the, the first thing I got to say is that, um, well, first, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. And um, uh, thanks to the Students for Democratic Reform and also the Federalist Society for putting it together. Um, the National Popular Vote Plan does not abolish the Electoral College. It, it changes the way we're using the Electoral College to advance a national popular vote. Um, if you consult your constitutions, you'll see that in Article 2, Section 1, um, the states are given what the Supreme Court has described as exclusive and absolute and plenary power to decide how to award their electors. And in the last few centuries, states have used everything from awarding electors by congressional district to, uh, which a couple of states still do today, Maine and Nebraska, uh, to doing it by specially appointed presidential districts, which a lot used to do, to naming specific people <laughs> in state law as the electors to the system that most states use today, which is winner take all. But it's up to the legislatures to do it. And the Supreme Court reemphasized that as recently as 2000 in Bush versus Gore. So the national popular vote campaign starts with that insight that it's up to the legislatures how to do it. And we say that we're going to appoint our electors um, according to who wins the national popular vote, not who wins the vote in our state. And I'm proud that I was the first state legislator to uh, introduce this in the state of Maryland, which became the first state to pass the National Popular Vote Agreement, the Interstate Compact. There are now um, about a dozen states on it and the District of Columbia. We're more than halfway there in terms of getting to 270 electors, which of course is the number you need to win in a presidential contest in the Electoral College, and that activates the compact. Why do we need to do it? Well, um, I've got a, a whole little presentation about that, but should I wait yeah, to give it to you or go, should I tell you? Yeah, go for it. We'll, we'll basically, each have a, a little bit of chunk of time up front here to, to state your positions. So. Okay. <clears throat> um, the, the problems, I think, um, are both uh, intuitive and obvious, but then also quite subtle and complex. Let's start with the intuitive and obvious ones. Our elections are not democratic. They don't, they don't choose the candidate who wins most votes. We don't guarantee a majority vote winner. We don't even guarantee a plurality vote winner um, because of the way that <coughs> the elections are designed. So in two of our last five elections, the popular vote loser 
George W. Bush in 2000 and Donald Trump in 2016 um, has prevailed in the Electoral College. So we don't have a democratic system for electing the president, which comes as quite a shock to uh, maybe a majority of the American people who think that we've got one. And certainly when you <coughs> ask people, do you want to use an Electoral College system, state-based electors, uh, or do you want to just have the person who gets the most votes win? Uh, overwhelming majorities say in every poll that they want to have a national popular vote plan. Now think about it. This is how we elect governors. This is how we elect U.S. senators. This is how we elect U.S. representatives. It's how we elect mayors, council members. Everybody is elected that way. Think of it this way, which is the way that the founders invited us to think of it, like Thomas Jefferson, who always said, think anew. If you were to set up presidential elections today, would you have a national popular vote for president? Or would you come up with something like the Electoral College vote system? And I dare say the vast majority of people would say, let's just do it the way we do everything else. Whoever gets the most votes wins. One person, one vote. Every vote counts, and every vote counts equally everywhere in the country. Well, what's the effect of not doing it that way? Well, there are bizarre perversities that arise within our system. In 2016, um, 95 percent of campaign resources and campaign visits went to a dozen states. And two-thirds of the resources went to six states, uh, Florida, Virginia, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. You know what the swing states are. As millennials, you make your decisions about where to register to vote based on the electoral college in your state and the closeness of the election. People understand exactly uh, how the system works if they're politically uh, engaged and sophisticated. But in the vast majority of the country, there's no presidential election. So think of our four biggest states, um, New York, Florida, Texas, and California. Three of the four are safe blue or red states. So there's no presidential election to speak of in New York. There's no presidential election to speak of in California. Everybody knows those two states are blue. There's no presidential election to speak of in Texas. Everybody knows it's red. Only Florida, one out of the four top states, has a real competitive election where the, res the resources of the campaigns are put in to set up offices, to have door knocking, to have campaigning, TV ads, and so on. And you get it's a total shutdown and flyover territory in other places. So you say, aha, it works the way the founders wanted it to work. It works for the small states. Not at all. If you look at the dozen smallest states, 11 of the 12 are themselves flyover territory. So think about Rhode Island or Delaware, or the District of Columbia, or Hawaii. Small blue states, they're ignored by the Democrats, they're ignored by the Republicans, because if you think like a campaign strategist, you've got to put your resources where the real election is happening. Similarly, um, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, um, Idaho, fly over red states. Neither party goes to compete there. That's true of most of the states in the country, and it's true of most of the American people. We're just bypassed by the election. I'm from Maryland, a, a blue state, and proudly so. I chaired uh, the Obama campaign in 2008 as a state senator in Montgomery County, which is a million people in it. We could not get campaign lawn signs in Montgomery County from the campaign. They said, no, we're sending everything to Virginia. You send all your volunteers to Virginia, and you send all your money to Virginia. And it's not because they had contempt for Maryland. It's not because they wanted to undernourish our campaign organizations and our campaign activity, although that was the clear result of it. It was because of the strategic necessity to go to the swing states. And that's a tiny minority of the states. And that's the way the system works. And it's just bizarre and perverse. And nobody would set it up that way. In fact, we spend millions or tens of millions of dollars teaching other countries about how to write a constitution, how to set up elections. One thing we never export is the Electoral College. No other country would ever say, oh yeah, let's do our elections the way you do your presidential elections in America. It just doesn't happen. And so this is an artifact. It is a relic, and I can get into the history if you're interested, but it's not working for us anymore. It invites strategic mischief and corruption at the state level, which it very clearly did in 2000, as in Florida, where the, um, the Bush campaign chair doubled as the state election supervisor, Catherine Harris, and managed to oversee strategic vote suppression from the beginning of the campaign to the end of the campaign. Um, and if you can settle an election in Florida by 537 votes, which they did out of tens of millions cast, 
you get all the electors in the state. That also escalates the possibility and the invitation, the moral hazard of strategic mischief from abroad now. In 2016, um, Vladimir Putin showed himself to be extremely savvy about how our electoral college works. And the Russian trolls tried to get into 21 state election computer systems, um, as far as we know, unsuccessfully, but they tried to hack in. If you can hack into one or two states, you could decide the entire election because of the way that it works, as opposed to having a real national election where the chances of a tie or a, a, an election being settled by a few hundred votes is almost nil. Um, and mathematicians can explain to you uh, why that's the case. So basically, this system is obsolete, it's creaky, it's vulnerable, it's inefficient, it's undemocratic, it's unrepublican. Sometimes they say, you know, this is the great wisdom of the founders. They wanted to deliberate about uh, who should be president. It doesn't work like that, right? No electors deliberate. In fact, most states have laws against deliberation. They're saying you've got to vote automatically, robotically, for whichever state electoral delegation you're put on. And so you've got to vote for whoever um, wins okay. in that state. So it's explicitly opposed to deliberation. And, and let me just, final point, is that the way that democratic change has taken place in America, and it's always in a democratic direction if you look at our Constitution, right? So you look at the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery, the 14th Amendment equal protection, 15th Amendment extends voting rights um, regardless of race. The 17th Amendment shifted mode of election of U.S. Senators from the legislatures to the people. The 19th Amendment gives us woman suffrage. The 23rd Amendment gives people in D.C. the right to participate, participate in presidential elections. The 24th Amendment abolishes the poll tax. The 26th Amendment lowers the voting age to 18. All of them are opening democracy up, and they're replacing indirect filters that were put into the original Constitution. And it is almost always by state legislative action first like what we're doing with the national popular vote. It bubbles up from the states. People say, this is ridiculous what's going on. For example, in the 17th Amendment, direct election of US senators before it got into the Constitution in the 17th Amendment was done by the way of state legislators saying, we will be bound by the popular vote in the states. And that's essentially what we're doing in the national popular vote campaign. We're saying the uh, state legislatures will be bound to give their electors to whoever wins in the nationwide vote. It's not ideal because it's never ideal because it's messy trying to replace a really broken um, and corrupted system like this. I think that once we have one or two election cycles like that, we will then be able to force Congress to go ahead and to amend the Constitution. It'll be sent out to the states and it'll be passed unanimously or overwhelmingly by the states. And we've got Democratic and Republican support, including uh, Newt Gingrich, who has spoken out for it. It's passed mostly in blue states so far, but a number of Republican-held state legislative chambers have passed it, including the New York Senate, uh, the Oklahoma House, and a number of other Republican ones. So we've got bipartisan support uh, across, you know, across Oklahoma, the board. apparently. Yeah, and, and let me, I'll close with Donald Trump quotes, because Donald Trump <laughs> said, let me just read you, he said, this was in 2012 when he believed, <coughs> wrongly, but he did believe that Romney was about to lose um, to, uh, or that, that Romney was going to win in the popular vote but lose in the Electoral College vote, and he wrote, or he tweeted, uh, the Electoral College <laughs> is a disaster for democracy, a total sham and a travesty that makes us the laughing stock of the world. And on that point, I do agree with Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Congressman. Um, Mr. England, you have a lot to respond to there, so I guess we'll give you the floor. I do, and I'm glad to see uh, Donald Trump's support to, to that, that side of the table. I <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, that's okay with me. Uh, I think that was rhetorical. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I want to respond to a few things. But I want to talk just, just at the very beginning about how to think about the, the electoral college, just how to think about an elect electoral system, because I think that sometimes we make a lot of assumptions, and, and frankly, I mean, the, a couple of things that were stated just simply aren't, aren't true. I think it helps to walk me into that. There are other countries that use electoral colleges. There are other countries that use systems that are maybe even more counterintuitive, according to the rationale just described, to select their chief executive. They're called parliamentary systems. Um, India, which if you want to look around the world and look for nations with uh, large, diverse populations, a lot of risks of regionalism, India has. You know what they have? They have an electoral college. I actually call it that. Uh, 
Other countries have multi-step uh, uh, multi -step selections of their chief executive that actually have been found. We, I think maybe both of us were at an MIT conference where they talked about elections a few years ago. And one of the points some of those researchers have identified is that systems like France um, depending on how you look at it, there are different ways to think about electoral le legitimacy. Um, but multi-stage direct election schemes actually oftentimes have less legitimacy because of that first step, weeding out candidates who would have won had they made it to the, to the uh, final round, if you will, uh, relative to the Electoral College. So it's not, it, it's not even obvious that you know, this is some outlier. Actually, it's obvious that this isn't some outlier, right? Uh, parliamentary systems, as I mentioned, are uh, found all around the world. And, uh, and when we talk about a national executive, we talk about representing a large and diverse uh, nation, right? We're talking about something that is obviously inherently more complicated than a state legislative district or even a governor's race. So I want to put that out there first. Secondly, this whole law school exists uh, because we don't make decisions in the United States simply based on public opinion polls, right? And I, I dare say that there's not a single person in this room who thinks that every provision of the Bill of Rights should be subject to majority will, right? That's, that is one of the things that we value as Americans is majority will and, and is our electoral process. It's not the only thing. And I, I haven't, you know, I'll, I'll tell people, people will say, oh, the Electoral College is not perfectly democratic. I'll say, look, if, if you're upset about that, let, let me show you some things in the Constitution that aren't just imperfectly democratic. Let me show you some things in the Constitution that say to majorities, you can never do this and you can never do that. And of course, it starts in the Bill of Rights. Well, it starts before the, before the Bill of Rights, but it's explicit in the Bill of Rights, right? We don't, we don't say that majority will is the, uh, is the only thing we value as Americans. So there must be some other ways to think about a presidential election process. And I want to suggest a couple of these. One of them I already alluded to, that's, that is legitimacy. Uh, that is uh, perceptions of uh, perceptions of legitimacy, and also how many people actually buy into and support the winner of the election. And as I say, it's it is obviously when you just go out and ask people, oh, how should we run elections in the in the United States, right? People tend to to just have this I idea about maybe how they work or how they should work. But when you when you dive into public opinion polling, you dive into how elections work, not just in the United States but in other places, it is not obvious. Right, that the Electoral College is this outlier. There are a lot of people, majorities of people in many cases, who are upset with the way their systems work in places like France, and places like Britain, and places like India. Um, so other questions, fundamentally, does it work? Um, does it work? Is it stable? Um, does it function? I want to come back to that with a historical, uh, with a historical story uh, when I close. Uh, finally, incentives. What are the incentives created by the electoral system. And, uh, and, and by the way, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that the Electoral College is perfect with regard to any of these. Right? I tend to agree with Winston Churchill when it comes to the idea of elections in general. He said, democracy is the worst way to run a government, except that every other way that's been tried is even worse. Right? There's, there's no perfect system. I think sometimes you know, it's easy to say, well, the Electoral College, some people don't like it, and people disagree with it, and there's been fraud, and there's been this, and there's been that. Well. Uh, those things happen, you know, fraud happens in, uh, in county commissioner races. Uh, fraud happens in state legislative races, right? The idea that fraud is something unique to the Electoral College uh, obviously is just, just flat wrong. Uh, but what are the incentives that an electoral system creates? And when we think about national politics, uh, one of the challenges of the Electoral College is that it's been so successful. The incentives created by the Electoral College have been so successful. I, I'll talk about regionalism, right? One of the great concerns of the founders, read George Washington's farewell address. That was his big concern, right? It was regionalism. Uh, and people don't, you know, I, I'll throw this out. Nowadays, people say, well, we don't have that. We don't. So well, why don't we have that? It's kind of sort of counterintuitive. We used to have a lot of regionalism. I mean, a lot of really nasty regional politics in the United States. Why is it we don't have that anymore? And let me give you, let me give you one historical example of how this played out. Uh, that goes directly to the Electoral College. I, I mean, I'd love to hear if somebody has some other explanation for this. But think about, I don't have to have like electoral maps for post-Civil War American politics, right? Everybody knows. Democratic Party, very strong in the South. Republican Party, strong in the North, not as strong as the Democrats were in the South, but dominant in the North, right? This was, this was the party divide post-Civil War in the United States. And uh, long story short, there, there are two elections where the Electoral College came into play in the obvious way. Obviously, it, 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 the incentives it creates are, are effective uh, to some degree in every election. 
But uh, 1876, the Democrats almost win. Historians have looked back at that and say, you know, some people say, oh, it's a corrupt bargain. Historians have looked back at that and said, actually, the Electoral College swung the election away from the person who committed fraud, away from the party that committed fraud. And so if you don't want the fraudster to win, it was a right winner election, not a wrong winner election. Um, 1888, however, uh, when historians look at that, they see uh, Grover Cleveland losing re-election in 1888 because, uh, he, even though he won the most, uh, the most raw popular votes, he did not win the geographically distributed majority that the Electoral College requires. What was the effect of that? People will say, wrong winner election, bad, bad for legitimacy, wrong winner election. What was the effect of that? The Democrats in that election got 84% in South Carolina, over 70% in four other southern states. Right? The Democrat Party coalition in 1888 is very easy to understand. Uh, right? It was, it was a coalition built around the Deep South, cranking out popular votes in the Deep South, suppressing minority votes and suppressing Republican votes in the Deep South. I'm not saying this to make a partisan point, because obviously a lot of things have changed since then. But, but uh, that, was, that was how they got a raw popular vote majority. And it didn't work. The Electoral College said that doesn't work. Cranking out votes in South Carolina and, uh, and Georgia and Florida, that's not enough. You have to have better geographical distribution than that. And, uh, and so somehow this political party that was very regional, that could have won popular vote elections based on that regional strength, had to do something really strange. Had to reach out to Northern Catholics in particular. Right? That's really weird. Right? That, that's actually, when you think about who was supporting the Democratic Party in the South in the 1880s, like that's, that's actually very counterintuitive. Why would they do that? Right? Well, they noticed that the Republicans were lazy. The Republicans said, we've got this thing locked down, and so we can be bigots to these new immigrants from places like Ireland and places like Italy in the north. And the Democrats said, look, we, you know, we'd, love to, we'd love to keep our 84% in South Carolina, but look, we can lose. We can lose 10%, 20%, right, from the extreme if we can pick up enough votes in the north and in some of these new western states to win elections. The Electoral College creates incentives right, that force parties not just to gin up as, get as much intensity as they can in their strongest areas, but forces the kind of 50-state strategy that uh, uh, former, former DNC chairman talked about that I, I think is good for our country and, uh, and, and is at least something that you should weigh in the balance against all of the rhetoric about how, well, you know, we should just, uh, we should just have a raw vote system and, and wouldn't, that be, uh, wouldn't that be more straightforward? I've got a lot more things to say, but National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, specifically, I think I'll hold that off because I suspect we'll get to that. Right. Um, a lot of risks inherent in that way of, of trying to address no, things. We'll definitely get to that. But, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. So I think just so I understand it, I, I get the, re the incentive not to constantly just get all your votes from South Carolina, or in this case, it would be California. But uh, what, what is the perception of legitimacy that comes from the well, the electoral college. So the, the, it seems so, so counterintuitive. The test, I mean, there are different ways to think of legitimacy, right? How many people are ha sort of happy with the election outcome? How many people voted for the winner? Um, how many people supported the winner at the beginning? I think that, that was the test that where the electoral college tended to do better than uh, systems like, like the French system. Well, um, as compared to a national popular vote system, it's... Well, the, I mean, the French system is a national yeah, popular yeah. vote system, right? And the, and the problem there is... When you, have a, when you have a bunch of, and, and parliamentary systems all have this, but if, I mean, what's funny is people don't think about prime minister elections even in this way because it's so obviously undemocratic, right? That, that you know, people get away with saying, well, we're an outlier around the world. All the other countries do it this other way because they forget that every prime minister is elected through a system that's clearly less representative of popular will than... Uh, well, so it's a parliamentary here. system, but it, we don't have a parliamentary yeah. system. And that well, was rejected by our founders. Well, it, it, so exactly. we, have a, we have a president. But it's misleading to, to say that well, we're an outlier when most of these other countries that we think of as functioning democracies around the world are parliamentary. Of those countries who elect presidents, we're an outlier in using an electoral college rather than a direct popular vote. And again, I, I would challenge you to find well, one country that has written a constitution over the last several decades with American help that has adopted an <laughs> electoral college system. Well, uh, India is a little older than that. It is much India older. Is it's much older than that. And, but, but in any event, but, can I respond to some of the historical I think, stuff? I think the historical stuff is really interesting. I think yeah. it would be good to get a response. Okay, well, let's, let's grab the bull by the horns. Uh, the, um, the, electoral, the history of the Electoral College is completely intertwined with slavery and race. Um, and the three-fifths <coughs> compromise plays the central role here. And if you haven't studied this in your con law classes, tell your con law professors you need to spend some 
time with it. Um, the, the southern states took the position at the Constitutional Convention that the African American slaves should count 100% for purposes of reapportionment. Um, now, they, they didn't want them to count for anything else. They didn't want to give them the right to vote or to run for office, but they said they should count 100%. That way, they would inflate the power of the southern congressional delegations. The, um, the anti-slavery northerners said this is ridiculous. You don't allow them to vote. You're not going to allow them to run for office. Why should they count at all? And after going back and forth, they arrived at the three-fifths compromise, which was based on a figure that was actually in the Articles of Confederation with respect to taxation. But they came up with a three-fifths compromise. What was the effect of that? The effect of it was basically to take a million slaves in the South and to count them, 600,000 of them, for the purposes of increasing the congressional delegations from Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, and so on, through the southern states. There were more than a dozen new representatives elected in uh, 1800, the first census that took place uh, after the Constitution was developed and they got going. Okay, um, this is why, uh, and so, as you know, the Electoral College follows the number of representatives you have. So if you get a dozen extra representatives from the southern states, that's a dozen extra electors that go to the southern states. This is why uh, Thomas Jefferson was called, was the so-called Negro president, because his critics said that he was elected on the power of the slave representation in the southern states. And there's a a book of that title by Gary Wills, which is all about the Three-Fifths Compromise. Okay, four out of our five first presidents were slave masters from Virginia who brought slaves with them into the White House. Seven out of our first ten presidents were slave masters who brought slaves with them into the presidency. The Electoral College has always had this Dixie accent to it, this kind of Southern accent, even after the Civil War, even in the 20th century, um, a number of Southerners, when the Democratic Party began to move left on civil rights, a number of Southern Democrats left the Democratic Party and ran as independents, like Strom Thurmond, like George Wallace, like Harry Byrd from Virginia, in order to send a very sharp signal to the Democratic Party about what the cost would be politically if they didn't keep that Electoral College coalition intact. Now, your whole presentation, of course, is based on the historical irony that the two sides have flipped. Today, of course, the solid South is a Republican phenomenon. Now, we, the Democrats have been able to um, eat into it in Virginia and a couple of other states, but basically the, the Deep South from the Confederacy remains together in the party of white supremacy, which is the party of uh, the president today, of Donald Trump. Okay, so they just switch sides, which is all that you were explaining you know, in your discussion of it. Legitimacy, I think it's had very little legitimacy at all. I mean, why do you think Donald Trump has been talking from the very <coughs> first day about how there were five million people who voted illegally? He understands intuitively, instinctively, it's not a legitimate result, which is why he had to say there were millions of people um, who voted mysteriously and somehow uh, got you know, Hillary Clinton uh, three million more votes than he got in the presidential election. So I think everybody senses that a minority vote winner or a majority vote loser who becomes president starts off at a huge disadvantage in terms of legitimacy and oftentimes takes the country in directions the country doesn't want to go, like George W. Bush did. Uh, in the Iraq war, or Donald Trump and his party did in trying to repeal Affordable so, Care Act. So, you what, know, what's your response to the argument, which I think bears a response, that if we didn't have the Electoral College, the Democratic Party would basically just rack up votes can, in California and New York and stop trying to represent uh, North Carolina and South Carolina? Uh, uh, yeah. just okay. Now, I want everybody to think of this question like a political campaigner. If you were a <coughs> campaign manager, Okay, has anybody here ever managed a campaign? Like, wh where where did you manage campaigns? South Carolina. South Carolina. Okay, it was it a, a statewide campaign? Yes. Or, oh, for a governor or? Oh no no, I'm sorry, it was just representative for state state house. Okay, um, did anybody anybody ever manage a statewide campaign? Uh, I mean, well, let's go back to South Carolina. If you were managing a gubernatorial campaign in South Carolina, would you say let's figure out? Are you Republican or Democrat or? I am a Republican. Okay. If you were trying to figure out where to go get votes, <laughs> would you say, 
we're just going to go to the counties that are majority Republican? Or would you say, let's go find all the Republican votes we can, and let's try to campaign among the independents and Democrats too? And of course, everybody understands that's how you run for statewide office. When you're in California, you don't say, I'm just going to campaign in the two biggest cities, LA or San Francisco, and write off the other 50% of the state. If you, the state I know best is Maryland. You'd be crazy if you thought you're going to run for governor of Maryland as a Democrat and say, I'm just going to go to Baltimore and Montgomery County and Prince George's County, or I'm just going to run as a Republican and I'm going to go to the Eastern Shore and Western Maryland. I'm going to, I mean, it just doesn't work like that. Do you know what I mean? Okay. So the, I, I challenge the premise that any campaign manager candidate would do anything other than go out and try to get votes every place the best they can. Now, if there's limited resources, there will be a proportionate allocation of the money. But we've got eight congressional districts in Maryland, and both parties would have every incentive to go and try to get votes in each one of them. Okay, let's, let's let uh, I mean, Ms. Greenland respond. Pollsters, pollsters and consultants make millions of dollars on statewide races trying to figure out where to spend marginal campaign dollars. And it's not obviously a question of if there are limited resources. There always are limited resources. And uh, I mean, I, I don't, it's sort of hard to understand why pollsters and consultants make so much money on these statewide races in places like California, but also places like Maryland, if they're not really doing anything other than just telling, telling the candidate where the population base is. Obviously, there's a little more going on even in these, these, uh, these direct election systems. Will you yield so I can respond to that? But, uh, well, hang on. Let me, let me okay. get back to the history. Okay. Look, I mean, the historical argument seems to, se seems to come down to this between what I said, what Representative Raskin said, is, uh, I mean, think of it this way. Right? If you had a political system set up somewhere on some island um, by some vicious racist bastard and, uh, and, and you go there 20 years or 200 years later and you look at how that system is functioning, um, would you ask the question, was the guy who set this up a vic vicious racist bastard, or would you ask the question, is this system producing results that are better for equality or not? But look, you would ask the latter question, right? You would not say, well, you know, actually this system has produced this growing, I mean, we, we heard about this expansion of democratic rights in the United States of America under this system where we had the Electoral College and everything's wonderful. We talk about expanding democratic rights and all of this and we've got a Bill of Rights written by actually the same people who designed the Electoral College and the Electoral College was actually just based on Congress. So if we're concerned about the three of those compromise and all that, we should go back and look at the Congress before we look at the Electoral College. But I think, I mean, just, Again, back to how we think about these questions. I love the Electoral College because it takes me to these kind of questions. I mean, how do we actually evaluate this, right? Do we care more about the fact that, that Thomas Jefferson uh, was a, a, a racist and, and a slave owner, or do we care more about the fact that the reason why the Democratic Party became the party of of, uh, of FDR and the party of JFK is because of incentives built into the system by the Electoral College. Thomas Jefferson didn't understand that. Uh, I'm glad he didn't. I'm okay with that. But we can understand that now. We don't have to go back and sort of, you know, be so fascinated with the American founding that we miss the bigger picture of what has happened since then. I think when you look at what's happened since then and the incentives created by the Electoral College, the system at, at least makes a lot more sense than the kind of ad hominem approach to... Uh, to could I ask a question back? Professor Smith, to just about the, the, the targeting resources. Be my okay. guess. Well, what I'm saying is that under a national popular vote, there will be an allocation of resources proportionate to where the votes are. And in fact, what, one of the dramatic things that's taking place today is that you get 10% higher turnout in swing states than you get in safe states, right. where there's no campaigning, there's no offices set up, there's no TV ads and so on, but there's huge turnout in Ohio and Florida, but much less so in California or Texas or New York, because nobody's telling you to go vote and nobody's organizing you, right? So there's proportional allocation, and where is it? It goes to the states that just by coincidence happen to have relatively equal numbers of Democrats and Republicans, okay? That's where the targeting goes. Under a national popular vote plan, the targeting will go to where all the voters are. So everybody's part of it. Every vote will count equally. The Republicans will have to go to California and try to build the Republican Party, and that'll be good for political competitiveness in California. The Democrats will go to Texas to look for votes there and to try to, if they get an extra 100,000, 200,000 votes there, even if they lose in Texas, those votes still so count. So what you're saying is the that there's an incentive total. to go to a, to a red state for the Democrats, even if they, not, they don't they can get over a 50% line, but they, they, if they can get 30 or 40%, yeah. that's valuable. But also, yeah. the Republicans take Texas for granted, like the Democrats <coughs> take California or Maryland for granted. We had no visits from either Republicans 
or Democrats in the entire state of Maryland, five million people. I'm not saying we're as big as California or we're as big as Florida, but we're big enough to have somebody come there and talk to us about what we're concerned with. The, uh, the Fair Vote book, which you should check out called Every Vote Equal, talks about some of the policy distortions that take place because of the focus on the swing states and the way that there's a huge amount of federal resources that are channeled before presidential elections into Florida in Ohio in order to move them. And you get distortions in like the, the right wing um, Cuban uh, vote in Florida because you know it's a swing constituency within a swing state. And so a lot of people, Democrats and Republicans, go and pander to them, even if they're representing a position that's a tiny minority in terms of what the rest of the country feels. Right. So, Mr. Spiegel, you can respond to that. But let me ask you a, a, another question as well. What do you say to the fact that the, we, the Electoral College has worked toler tolerably well? Because most of the time, it follows popular vote. And then we have this kind of bizarre random exceptions, which have you know 13,000 vote margins in one state or another. That's what makes the thing seem so bizarre, that it, that it people don't pay any attention to it until you have this essentially accidental crack up every, well, see, every I, sometimes it's starting to happen more often of course I, I mean I disagree with a little, a little bit of the, the, the premise of the question it's fair. for this reason right the, the well I mean the, the the problem is the the incentives in the electoral college operate in every election but we only see the, and the electoral college decides every election right every election is is decided by the electoral college outcome it's just that usually the popular vote outcome is the same. And, you know, I mean, you go back to, um, you know, you go back to 2000. I, people have said this, yeah, obviously, after this last election, and I think it's laughable. But after the 2000 election, Karl Rove said, and I, I think this is, this is probably true, uh, but impossible to prove the counterfactual, that if the rules had been different, they would have ran a different campaign. Sure. They would have won the most popular votes, right? I mean, that's obviously at least possible. Give them the chance uh, to do it. If not, but, but, that's, but again, <laughs> the, the question is, right, yeah. what are those incentives that, that we only wind up talking about when we see this contrast, we see this difference? Uh, but do you care that the election takes place in at most a dozen states? Yeah, the, and so usually let me six states. let me talk about that because that's important. Yeah. It, it, yeah. I mean, it's it is it is important, but again, it's it's misleading. I've, I have read the national popular vote interstate compact material on uh, this targeting the swing states, and what's so funny to me and, and about the, the whole conversation around it is um, what's a swing state? Swing state's a state that it tends to be politically evenly divided, right? Well, what does that mean you have in swing states? <laughs> that means you have swing, swing uh, you, you tend to have more swing congressional districts potentially. You certainly have swing U.S. Senate seats uh, in many cases at least, right? I mean, there's a lot more going on in our electoral system than just the presidential election. And, you know, so you mean they're like little laboratories for the whole country? Well, Instead of having direct democracy, everybody vote, those states or like a proxy. Well, I'm, I'm not, I'm, not yeah. I'm just pointing it out. I'm just pointing out oh. there's something a little bit disingenuous about saying the Electoral College is the reason for pork, right? I mean, obviously there, there are a lot of things going on there. I mean, you know, I, you and I would probably agree on things like gerrymandering that are, I think, I think much more corrosive to our system. <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry. It's the same problem. I, yeah. It, it, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, well, it's related to why elections have become so close. We have much better technology, um, you know, micro-targeting and just the way campaigns are run today. But, but look, the fact is, you know, I've, I've run for office much less successfully than you have, uh, but but campaigns are always making decisions. I mean, other than the very smallest, um, and it, it, look, I mean, this is part of why I'm actually I'm a conservative. I'm I'm, I'm a localist, subsidiarity, federalism, like push the power down, right? Because ultimately, when you push the power up. Uh, the whole idea of representation becomes very fuzzy and, and almost spiritual rather than actual, in my opinion. But, uh, I mean, the, the reality is that campaigns are always making decisions about who to talk to. I mean, I was told, you know, yeah, the reason you lost that, that election um, one of the times that I ran was because you tried to I just literally told this. You tried to treat every voter equally. You didn't focus on the people who... You, you could have told, you could have hired a better consultant to tell you, like, you, you should focus on these people and <coughs> ignore all these people, right? And this is the standard reason why first-time candidates get shellacked, is because they don't understand that. They, they, they want to they wanna live in this world where you should, I just talk to everybody, I just treat everybody equally, and that's how you lose elections, right? Um, the fact is, if you abolish the Electoral College under any system, you will get a shuffling of the deck when it comes to things like pork, when it comes to which voters get focused on, you will shuffle that all up. You will not have the same political map, but you will still have a political map, and it won't just be this smooth purple map of the whole country. That, that's not how elections work. 
right? That's not why Karl Rove and David Plouffe and all those guys make, make a lot of money, right? They make money micro-targeting Americans, whether it's a presidential race or a gubernatorial race. And I just, I worry, I, I guess I feel like that's not the right conversation, right? There's a legitimate debate, electoral college or not, but that's a false promise that if you do away with it, you'll have, you have what we have in Congress, right? You'll have, you have swing areas of the country you're still going to have a lot of people left left behind because that, let, that's me, let me ask a, a, a different question to change the subject a little bit. I think a lot of people have the assumption that the the reason we have an electoral college was that they were supposed to be a bulwark against popular will and that they were supposed to deliberate in some way and decide that the person chosen by the majority was was bad. Uh, is there any historical validity to that at all? I mean, that is what they, that is what they assumed well, and not what they did from the very first election. Okay, if you, if you reconstruct what was taking or place third. back in the 18th century, um, first of all, there was no right to vote in the Constitution. Um, the, you know, it was, a, it was not government of the people, by the people, and for the people, as our last great Republican would come to <laughs> describe it as. Uh, um, it, it was a slave republic of white male property owners. Um, in, in most places. And so it didn't even make sense to talk about a popular vote. And they wanted to make sure that every part of the country got to participate the way it could. Now, there were proposals for state legislatures electing the president. There were proposals for members of Congress electing the president. And then they ended up um, using the electoral college system, allowing the legislatures to come up with it in order to you know, incorporate whatever the values of the state were. And we're remaining faithful to that purpose at this point. We're saying, let's have the state legislatures get together, uh, using their powers both to create an interstate agreement and to appoint electors as they see fit, in order to say, we're beyond this, and let's try a real national popular vote election. So uh, the curious thing is that the way it's practiced today, winner take all in the states, only three states did in the first presidential election that took place after 1789. Um, most states were either using the main Nebraska system, a congressional districts, or they set up special presidential districts. So you know, s there's some myth out there that this is the way it's got to be done. It's not even being done that way today, much less right. historically. There's been tremendous Do you variety. want to comment on that? Or? Well, it, it, I mean, just two things on the history. One is that, that uh, the the legislature does have the power to award the electoral votes, but if you look at the language in Article II, uh, the electors belong to the state, right, as a, as a polity, right, the people of the state, and then the legislature is empowered to decide how to represent them with, elect with the electors. And every system that's ever been used has been ostensibly uh, to represent the political will of that state. National popular vote interstate compact would be the first time the language in Article II has been interpreted to allow the legislature to explicitly ignore the political will of the state, whose electors they are, and award those electors based on something extrinsic to the state. Right, right? but so they the, don't have to have an election, right? Uh, so that, right, that's, I mean, that's true, but if Ignoring the political are, will of the state is the way that it's worked most of the time. It's, it's worked by, you know, a lot of states used to just appoint electors, <coughs> wise elders who would decide you know, when the Constitution, you know, first was written, the first several elections, there were particular people who were named electors. And so the, the fact that we've gone to majority vote in most states today of the state is great, but we, there's nothing that binds the state legislature not to say we will be bound to choose the electoral college slate that Later. is pledged Later. to the winner of the national election. Well, it, it, is, it is, though, uh, I mean, even when legislators directly appoint electors, that ostensibly is representing, if through a two-stage election process, right, the political will of that state. I mean, it's still, NPV is yeah. still, it's not just a different thing on that spectrum, right? It's a totally different, right. we're going to do something extrinsic. That's an argument that was made against states before the passage of the 17th Amendment, saying we're going to have a popular election for a U.S. Senator and we'll be bound by the yeah. result, which is what the state legislatures did. And so people said, you can't do that. You've got to use your expertise as state legislators to pick the senator for the people. And this, the Supreme Court said, no, that's, you know, so there's no problem with uh, this. The, 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 say the national uh, popular vote thing works uh, and you get over 270. Are there, uh, how many lawsuits are going to be filed the next day to prevent it? And what do you see as the risks to this system uh, from, from operating going you forward? You know, hey, th this is America, so... Uh, you know, the, the, these guys know that people can come up with... That's what we're training them to do here. You know? <laughs> so that's right. So th this is part of the solution then. Uh, 
Look, there are lawsuits under the current system. We saw Bush versus Gore, which demonstrated the profound problems and inadequacies uh, of the system. Uh, and you know, we've seen the vulnerabilities as recently as 2016 of now cyber invasion and sabotage um, being a possibility. So there's real problems in our elections. I'm for a national electoral commission, the kind that exists in Canada or in Mexico, to make sure that we don't have political actors in charge of our elections, but we've got independent, nonpartisan body doing it. But having said that, I, I think that uh, you know this is great fertile material for law review articles for those of you um, interested in it, but I think there are answers to any complaint that anybody can make that this somehow uh, defies uh, you know, either the founder's design or the structural design of the Constitution. It, it really doesn't, and it is the way, historically, that we've made our way to more democratic processes in the country. And do you have, aside from the fact that you think it doesn't reflect the original idea that each state's supposed to have a separate political will, is there something else wrong with this that doesn't, makes it not workable? Well, I, I mean, I do think that it requires the consent of Congress because it does, it, it, I mean, it, it is directly relevant, obviously, to a federal office and how a federal official is selected. So I think a lot of the arguments made about, oh, like, you know, compact clause, jurisprudence, uh, I think don't don't come to bear on this. But I mean, obviously, there there is jurisprudence all over the place on compact clause. I do think that issue of just whether there are any boundaries at all on the state legislature disregarding the will of the people. I think that's an issue there. You know, and, and but but I don't setting that aside. I think the the greater the greater concern here, and and this is an area where we're just going to disagree because because you'll probably like this scenario. But the reality is, in the country we live in today, right? When you have a presidential election under this system. If it's at all close, and yeah, as we learned from you know from the from Twitter, um, you know, close is a relative thing. Uh, what you're going to have is you're going to have whoever loses, right? Say, um, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders becomes president in in, in uh, 2020, right? Um, you're going to have people in Texas watching a certain uh, cable news channel that's saying. Uh, we've heard reports that in Los Angeles and Chicago, there's the potential that there were tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or however many votes you need, right, to, uh, to pull the election into, into, uh, into contention or the other way around, Donald Trump wins re-election and you've got uh, people watching another news, cable news network saying, well, we've heard that this happened in Texas or this happened in Oklahoma or whatever. The, the, the problem is, right, the system we have today, as imperfect as it is, swing states tend to be states where you have the most political accountability by virtue of the fact that you have the closest thing to political parity, right? That you have less political accountability where you have one party control. You tend to see more, I used to work on election fraud, and this is something most of the people who talk about election fraud get totally wrong. Most election fraud happens in places in one party control in primaries. It doesn't, doesn't happen in these closely, you know, anyhow, another topic, another right? Topic, yes. but, uh, but, but the problem is, right, you would have people saying, what's my redress? How do I know this election is, is, is fair, right? And the only thing to do is to go to the politicians in Washington, D.C., as happened in 1876, and luckily that sort of worked out relatively well. Um, and, I mean, the, the fraud didn't swing the election, uh, many other negative effects. But, uh, but look, you, you, you want to make the presidency more, more important. You want to give political power, more political power of election administration to Washington, D.C. This would create a powerful incentive to do that. I know some people think that's a great thing. I tend, again, I think subsidiarity, decentralization, I think that's a safer way to respond to the Russians than let me, let me making it so they can hack one what, system. What, let's sort of talk about the elephant in the room, and then we'll open, up, open it up for questions. I, I think a lot of people, maybe some in this room, a lot of people around the country think that this has turned into a De de debate between liberals and conservatives, between Democrats and Republicans, because the Electoral College is perceived as, in the current uh, uh, demographic environment, political environment of the country, more likely to elect a minority president who's a Republican than a Democrat. Let me ask you, uh, uh, try to, do you think that's actually empirically true? And if so, is that really what's going on here? So I think, um I think that I think that in if you take a snapshot of politics right now, I think that's true. Um, I think is there I, a reason for that? Um, I think there is. Although let me let me let me the point of caution here. Democrats in two thousand and I think two thousand and four. Four. It almost Colorado, happened in reverse. You know. Yeah. yeah, yeah right. In Ohio was it was gone two hundred thousand votes. No, exactly. And, and Democrats said we want we want to put on the ballot in Colorado a measure. After, I think after the two thousand four or during two thousand four to make Colorado's electoral vote proportional because they said. We're never going to win Colorado, but we at least should get, you know, 
uh, just shy of 50% because we keep getting close there. And of course, the next, they lost. Um, but the next election that would have affected was 2008 when Barack Obama won Colorado, right? So partisans, partisans are always, they're always fighting the last war, the, la the last election, right? And they're always thinking they can game the system. I mean, I think what Republicans have tried to do in places like, like uh, Michigan and Pennsylvania to, to jury rig the election system there to their benefit, I think is disgraceful. Um, and, and also, why, why would it favor in general Republicans in the current environment? Look, the, the, a, part of, a part of the American founding was agrarianism, especially among the Jeffersonians, right? And there was, I think, a recognition that the tendency of political power is that it flows into the cities. Right, and, and that the cities tend to be, you know, you go back and we talk about Athens, the great democracy of Athens, where the people who lived in the city were so excited because they got to go and vote on the hill and they got to survive off of all these slaves in the hoi polloi who lived round and about the city, right? And that, that was the tendency in the ancient world and even the tendency in the modern world. And we have a constitution designed to try to prevent that, create incentives against it, and it just happens today in American politics, right, that Democrats tend to be more powerful in urban centers and Republicans tend to tend to draw a lot of their support from rural and suburban kind of, you know, ex-urban areas. And, uh, and look, that, I mean, I think that will change um, over time, but I do think that, uh, you know, hmm. that has just the, and then you got to go into individual states, the way it works out in individual states, that has produced a momentary benefit for Republicans, could flip around you know, and I, I guess Democrats. I have to say, I don't really understand if that's true, but you seem to agree with them, so why don't you tell us? What well, <clears throat> first of all, there's nothing guaranteed about our particular party system that would suggest that one party is going to get more votes than the other in the popular vote. In fact, when I, when I was... Well, it's pushing, been a pretty strong pattern in one direction. Well, you know, I'm going to suggest why, but let me just say, as a matter of principle, it shouldn't make any difference. And when I introduced the national popular vote, legislation in Maryland, I was in my caucus and all these senators were coming up to me saying, come on, really, like, who's this going to help, them or us? And I'm like, it's going to help whoever gets the most votes. That's it. it you, you can't jerry-rig that. Now, at a time when one party is identified with a shrinking demographic and another party is identified with expanding demographic groups, immigrant groups, um, groups that have been traditionally excluded and so on, then you can see that a party that that party is going to be more interested in a popular election and the other party is going to be more interested in figuring out how you jerry rig the electoral college to its favor and that's basically I think why a lot of Republicans despite the fact that a majority of Republicans support the national popular vote right. when you do a poll and despite the fact that a lot of prominent Republicans are on its side, still a lot of the strategists are saying, let's stick with what we've got and, rather than try to... And do you, you know, think that the that perception of disadvantage to the Democrats, advantage to the Republicans, is going to make it tough to get any more states to sign on? No, I, I think, uh, again, Donald Trump is a great example. He's somebody who says we should just have a popular Election. He said that when he thought a Republican was going to lose the uh, Right, he changed, but I think he, <laughs> in, in his inimitable way, he kind of speaks for people who are, you know, who are going to bring kind of a fresh look at politics and just say, it doesn't make any sense to have the system. And he said repeatedly, whoever gets the most votes wins. I mean, the thing about agrarianism, the Supreme Court addressed that back in Reynolds versus Sims and Westbury versus Sanders when it determined the principle of one person, one vote in congressional elections and state and legislative elections. And it said, <laughs> legislators don't represent trees and acres uh, or counties, they represent people. And people are gonna be the essence of what democracy is. So all we're trying to do is follow through on the one person, one vote cases to say we should have one person, one vote for the president. I mean, you know, Sometimes when I debate people, but they say, well, what about the U.S. Senate? Because the U.S. Senate is way malapportioned. You know, California gets the same number of senators as Idaho or Vermont. And I think that that's a stronger argument. But, of course, the Senate is a deliberative institution. And so at least you're getting deliberation out of it. We only have one president. So why does it make sense ever to elect a president who's going to represent the minority of views of Americans as opposed to the majority of the people. It just doesn't make sense. If we're going to have a president, that president should be elected the way we elect governors, U.S. senators, mayors, members of Congress, whoever gets the most votes wins. I, I have a lot more questions, but let me, let, me uh, let, the, let you guys participate. You've been very anxiously trying to get a question <coughs> here, so why don't we start with you. Well, I'm Bobby Lawrence, and I'm a candidate for the United States Senate in Pennsylvania. And I have one particular scenario that I want to lay out, and I, I need everybody in the room to understand this. The dangers 
with the national popular vote movement. Let's say that everybody here lives in California. California's gonna vote for the Democrat. By and large, your votes will go for the Democrats. That's historically accurate. Now, a Republican is the national popular vote winner. That means that the 55 electoral votes that you have will be cast for the Republican, even though the majority of your state voted for the Democrat. The National Popular Vote Compact assigns the power to the National Popular Vote winner to come into your state and remove your elected delegates and replace them with someone who will vote for the National Popular Vote winner. This is a double-edged sword. It affects both Republicans and Democrats. The challenges that the Congressman wishes, the problems that he's laid out are accurate. How we address it, I am 180 degrees opposed to what he says. How we address it is by not winner take all states. We address it by apportionment. The number of counties, if you look at California, the number of counties, the number of cities, apportionment <coughs> is where it's at, not winner take all. That's the way to get more power back to your vote. Are you saying you would do it by congressional districts? Is that what you're saying? The way, the way that it is, the way that it is set up in the founding documents is that the state legislature is assigned. Now, the people in the state have to lobby their state legislators to make their electoral delegates proportional to the popular vote within the state. That's the way to come to the outcome that the congressman wants. So I'm, I'm going to ask so, you this, folks. Are you okay with you voting one way and having all your elected delegate votes go another way? Right. That's not something you want to, resp yeah, to respond to. That's an awesome question. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I, let's let the congressman uh, th respond. Thank you, and good luck on your uh, <laughs> your campaign for well, U.S. Senate. Thank you. And that's the good. challenge you so, laid out, I agree with. Yeah. The way we get to solving it, I just I don't agree with you. All right, well, uh, and let me tell you what, why I dissent from what you just articulated. You said, how would the people of California feel if their 55 electoral college votes, say, for Hillary Clinton, were completely overridden and the and Donald Trump becomes president. It just happened, despite the fact that they yeah, gave their fifty five. Wait, well, let me finish my let, point. Let, let, finish let me finish my point. You'll get used to this in debates. You got to listen to your opponent. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you, not only when did they give. The, the, not you've got to listen regardless of what you think. Okay. So uh, that's why we have politics. All right, so, come on. Fifty five electoral college votes in California were appointed for Hillary, and a majority of Americans wanted Hillary and they lost it, okay? So would they be willing to trade that system for a system where the winner of the national popular vote wins, i.e. Hillary beats Trump in 2016, for a system where all of the electors go to the winner? Of course they would. That's just like the changing of the guard. Who cares whether you cast your 55 electors and you lose? What they want is to be able to have the popular will expressed. I don't think the people of California are saying well, we think that our candidate should become president even if everybody else in America votes for the other candidate. They're not saying that. They're saying we think that the winner of the national popular vote should win. And I was amazed at the anti-California propaganda I heard from Republicans around the country after the election saying, oh, well, you know, those millions of votes could have just been in California and who cares about them and they're all Democrats. Basically, the Republicans are just surrendering California. I mean, that's an amazing and kind of undemocratic, maybe even unpatriotic way to think about another state, which is part of the United States. So uh, basically, I've heard this argument before. It's sort of the don't blame me. I'm from X thing. And our <laughs> electors went in a futile way in the other column. Nobody cares about that. What people want is for the winner to win the election. So uh, there are a lot of half measures out there that you could do along the lines of what the, the, oh, the well, future senator suggested. Could I address that? See the you, congressional... The, perhaps the worst proposal of all <laughs> is That's what to, I was going for. The worst proposal of all <laughs> is to allocate electors by congressional districts. Here, here. And all you got to think about is the gerrymandering, okay? Because if you could gerrymander Congress the way that the GOP <laughs> exists behind a wall of gerrymandered districts, which is why we've got to build a big blue tidal wave in 2018 to overcome that wall. But that will translate into the Electoral College because now they're able to gerrymander the presidential election even worse than it's gerrymandered now. You know, Ohio today 
um, has the same population as the dozen smallest states, okay? But um, those states have an additional, I think it's 18 or 20 electors over Ohio because of the, the two senator bonus you get for the electoral college. It's your number of representatives plus the two senators. So the dozen smallest states have the same population as Ohio, but they get about 20 more electors sure. than Ohio does. But uh, and so, you know, that... I mean, it it seems like the worst thing you could do is do it by congressional district, not consistently. I mean, obviously, it'd be terrible yeah. if you did it the whole country, but if, if you only do it in, the, in states that tend to vote blue, which is what they yeah. were trying to do a couple well, of years Jefferson ago, that would addressed be really that. Bad. Jefferson well, addressed but, but that of course, specifically. But, of course, some of those states, at least one of those, wait, two, both, two of those states went for Trump, right? And so they would, I mean, that's what's really funny about this. Colorado, the Democrats tried to, tried to manipulate it, and it would have hurt them. Republicans have tried to manipulate Pennsylvania Virginia. and Michigan. Let's take the manipulation out. Let's just, right. Let's just have an election. Let's just have an election. What, what, what That's would you all think suggesting. about his suggestion, which is all the states basically cast it proportional to the popular vote in the state? Have an interstate compact for so, proportional. Well, let's see. All the problems still exist then. One, the loser in the national popular vote could still win, even if you did it proportionally within each state. It would be unlikely, though, because it, well, it would be pretty closely well, matching. Well, if what the you're trying to get at is that, why don't we just do it? Well, in other words, well. the, I've seen these proposals yeah. where yeah. somebody will get like 8.3765589 electors from a state, and another will get 4. That's just the same thing as a popular vote. That I mean, yeah, yeah, if we want to do with a popular Senate vote, bump. let's do a popular right. vote. With the Senate yeah. bump. All right, yeah. you, you in the back, and then we'll come over to Gil. Yeah. No, 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 we're, we're moving on to the next guy here. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. All New York? Well, up, I mean, upstate New York is not better uh, if you're a campaign strategist than Michigan, Eastern Michigan, <coughs> Pennsylvania, Ohio. I'm not certain the, the incentives would change all that much under that system. And even if they did, why would that necessarily be a good thing? Well, but, uh, again, I mean, I, I'm a candidate and not a campaign manager. It'd be interesting to call some campaign managers in and say, what would you do differently in a general election if we had a national popular vote? But I can guarantee you they will not say, let's spend all of our time in Florida and Ohio and North Carolina and Virginia and ignore 46 states. There's just no way. The Republicans would never say, let's ignore all of California, not just the Pelosi Democrats in San Francisco, but everybody in Orange County and Southern California. And the Democrats would never say, let's ignore Texas completely. Um, you know, and there's lots of, you know, Democrats were governors and U.S. senators from Texas. In fact, one way we revive real competition in the country is to move to a national popular vote. Because what happens is, is that the parties begin to pull the plug on particular states because they've got to focus their resources in these randomly assigned swing states instead of, you know, developing and nurturing organization everywhere. That's why when I first in introduced the NPV in Maryland, the first people to get behind it were Republicans saying we're completely bypassed and ignored in our state because they know we're going to lose. So they say, well, even if we get an extra 100,000 or 200,000 votes, what difference does it make? But in, an end, in a national popular vote system, it would be a big deal. Right. Wouldn't there be a concentration in the Rust Belt, though, because people who vote the same time be a bit more sensitive uh, to change and they're yeah. more on the fence? I mean, I love your question because what it suggests is the <laughs> calculation is going to change in every election, and people have different theories, and they'll see what works, right? And I think everybody can agree. I mean, one thing I've not really heard um, from you, Trent, is a strong defense of the random assortment of swing states where all the resources go and the abandonment of the rest of the country. I guess you were sort of saying that you thought that they were more representative of the rest of the country, they're kind of a barometer. Is that your no, argument? No, that's not. No, that, that's not why. I mean, I you do have higher political accountability, right? You, you closer, closer. Closer parity, I mean, right, any, any political system that's closer to 50-50 versus 90-10, right, the 50-50 system is likely to have better better accountability. I, I think that's, I mean, I've, I've lived in 
now I live in a hard red state. I've lived in, you know, I've lived in California. I've lived in Washington State. <laughs> I've lived in Virginia, right? And I, I think... I mean, Florida has very little accountability. I mean, their elections are a mess. You can barely get your votes counted. And so, I mean... But, but they the had Democrats running the county election, Republicans running the state, Democrats you dominating the state Supreme Court. You had a between two corrupt groups, right? you know? I mean, but I, I don't both know. Parties. I, 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 that feels like grasping at straws to me. Let, let's but get I, another yeah. question here. A uh, uh, Republican friend here, Gil. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. <laughs> here, um, so yeah, I guess everyone. Knows no more secrets know. around here. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm not a fan of the electoral college actually at all. Um, and my question is for you, Mr. England. I don't understand what the big deal is. Like, what's? I, I think you tried to answer the question before, um, and I'd like for you to, for simple minds like myself, what is the big deal of just getting rid of the electoral college and going to a popular vote that every you know like he's talking about? It seems to me being simple, like it's fair, it's easy, maybe even more Republican, you know, since you're conservative minded, you said maybe more conservatives in states like California and New York and the big blue states would come out because they would feel, well, my vote actually matters now. Like what's the big, oh my gosh, we can't do this because of this reason. So, I, I haven't caught that yet. So the, the electoral college uh, I mean, there, there are several things. One is, I think, that incentive that operate, and this is, I, I do get disturbed when I hear folks representing the national popular vote, very involved in the movement, saying, you know, we've never actually sat down and thought about how this would change our election system. We, we, we can poke holes at the Electoral College, and we don't like this, we don't like that, and I agree with them on some of those things. Um, but, but we've never actually sat down and wargamed out, you know, done the sort of like Federalist Papers type analysis, like, what if we change that what are the new things we don't like? Because obviously any system is going to be imperfect, right? And, and, and so, I mean, anybody asking for any change, the burden of proof is on them, and, and that's, a, that's an obvious process to go through. I think that over time, right, it makes regionalism and radicalism somewhat more likely in our politics, right? We have a, I mean, I, I think arguably the last two presidents um, have been probably further at the, the ends of the political spectrum in opposite directions, right? And, you know, uh, one, one person saying, you know, people who cling to God guns and or really or whatever the line was, right? And the other person saying, yeah, I want those votes, right? I mean, right? And, and, uh, and yet still we don't have really regionalism, right? We still have people going to the Rust Belt and that kind of relatively Wait, centrist you don't think we area. have a red state, blue state divide in America under the electoral college system? I, I mean, if, if you look, run for president today, no, I, this, is, this is serious business. When you run for president today, what you're doing is saying, I'm going to get these red states, I'm going to take them for granted, and I'm going to go for these narrow band of purple states, or I'm going for these blue states, I'm going to take them for granted, and this narrow band of purple states. That is all about regionalism. I mean, it just strikes me as comical that the argument you would come up against um, you come up with against the national vote is regionalism when this whole system is well, based on regionalism and regional allocation. It's, of it's, it's based college on votes. states, but states are not states are not are not regionals in the same. I mean, again, that's why I give the 19th century story, right? Which is which is again, again, it's 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 true. It's sort of obvious, right? I mean, the powerful incentives built into the system for the Democratic Party to say we don't, you know, we'll 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 let the extreme elements in our party leave us so that we can reach out to, to people who've been left behind by the other party. I mean, I, that incentive is in play in all these elections. And it's not just about the presidency. It's about what those incentives are that trickle down in the system. I, I think those are good things, right? And I don't, I think you lose, well, clearly, you completely lose those incentives in a direct election scheme. You also lose the effect that, I mean, today, and, and there's, there's a downside to this for sure, but there's an upside uh, of the fact that states are like watertight compartments in an ocean liner when it comes to elections. States administer their own elections. Uh, states are able to experiment with election administration within the bounds of federal civil rights laws. Some states vote entirely by mail. Some states vote mostly at the polls. Uh, equal protection laws do not lap over state, or e equal protection does not lap over state boundaries. You go into NPV and you, you create a need for, I think, a national election administration, more centralization, more control of presidential appoint, you know, by presidential appointees of future presidential elections. I actually think that's very frightening. I mean, I don't, I, I'm not a progressive. I don't think that history just always gets better. Actually, you look at the, er, the beginning of the 19th century, and we actually became less democratic from, the, the, from the, the constitutional period into the 1840s, right? That's actually not, it's not true that this story just always well, goes in one direction. I think we can actually make mistakes, and I don't want to do that. We have a question over here. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, 
Uh, um, I'm not quite sure, I guess, ultimately what is the best uh, presidential system, but I guess I'm more concerned not with what it does with campaigns, not with what it does with candidates, but what it does with voters. You know, this whole we the people thing. I ran in Bayonne, New Jersey, as a Republican. But I was in the Democrats by all the tickets. But because people do this, I don't know, label voting, I beat the mayor of Bayonne. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> I mean, what can we do in a voting system to make people think more? But also, I, I think it's kind of disingenuous to say that you can't pay in only one place, especially with the internet and things like that. There's responsibility on a voter to find out what's going on. It's not all on the candidate. It's not all on the party. And I think that if we start doing that, we stop having me going into a race and being okay. a Democrat. Mm. Right. <laughs> all right, so uh, you, like you, in here. Well, but I think it's an awesome point. I mean, the, what the system owes the people is an electoral process that makes everybody's vote meaningful and valuable. We can't guarantee they're going to get motivated to go out and do it. That's what parties are for. That's what organizations are for. But what we have now is a structure which systematically demobilizes and demoralizes large numbers of voters. And by the way, in Texas, it's not just hundreds of thousands of Democrats who don't turn out. It's hundreds of thousands of Republicans who also know their vote isn't really needed anymore. And it's the same thing with Democrats in California. They're like, well, we know we're blue. Why do we need to turn sure. out? I mean, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars are spent in every election. Everybody's got to vote. Do your civic duty, patriotic duty. And still we end up with 55 or 60 percent of the people voting. Why? It's built into the system. Let's have a system where every vote really does count. And I bet you we're going to see dramatic increases in the number of people but going out to vote of all parties and independents and, you know, people from left to right north to south. The national popular vote has been passed in California, in New York, in Vermont, in Hawaii. I mean, it's picked up tremendous support around the country. And there's just so much going on, it's hard to get people to focus on structural change. But that's why, you know, for me, it was worth it to come out and talk to you guys, because what we need is the young people, especially those who are in law school and college who are studying this stuff, to take up the cause, because we really can move this and make it happen. We're more than halfway there now. But I mean, that, 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 that just can't be right, because uh, I mean, turnout has been trending down. We've had periods of very high turnout in this country with an electoral college. We've had periods of very low turnout in this country with an electoral college. And when you look at the states that traditionally have the highest turnout, some of them happen to be swing states in some recent elections, but a lot of them don't. They have they have cultures of civic participation. New England states have tended to be, you know, Maine and New Hampshire, whether they're a swing state in that election or not, have tended to have extremely high participation rates. Right? I just. I, but I, do I, you agree that there's like a, about a ten point difference between? The swing states and the safe states. I mean, I can send you the stuff. Or there would it change is, your view if you were to learn that? There, uh, well, that's I've, I've looked yeah. at some of that research. That's yeah. not exactly. I mean, when, when you actually disaggregate the states and look at, I mean, there's clearly some more things going on. You have swing but it's a swing presidential race. not a race. value for you that everybody participate. And I, I think it is a value that everybody participate, that we get everybody involved. So we've got to set the incentives up in such a way that everybody's got an incentive. To I, go I, I will say it this way. I, I would prefer a system where where everybody participates but i don't think i don't think voting is a self esteem exercise for the for the 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 polis right i think that i think that what's valuable even about elections right and this goes back to my very first point about the bill of rights right we do not value majority will in this country uber allus right that is not an american value it's not a constitutional value it's not taught in this law school there are other things that we also value and so look if i mean if uh, if people who are racist are too lazy to get out and vote, I think that's great. I have no problem with that. I don't want them to turn out and vote, right? I mean, I I, I actually. I, what so, if they stop other people from voting? Well, you know, I have a huge problem with that, okay. right? I mean, right. Well, so, but that that that's been the American history, not the racists not being politically engaged, but they use their political power to stifle. Them. But see now, but now you're agreeing with me, right? Which is which is that that look? It's not just about majority will over all us. But there I agree are with other that. Things that, are that if you if you look at the Constitution. Um, there are lots of values that are expressed, and one of the values expressed in the Bill of Rights is the protection of individual freedom. And individual rights are absolutely right. But when you look at elections, everything from the way the Supreme Court counts its votes to how we generally pass legislation in the House and the Senate, I understand there's exceptions for treaties and impeachment and so on, but in general, the majority prevails in elections across the country. That's how we elect mayors and governors and senators. And the fact that you're pretending it's something else, you know, strikes me as off point. That's not the, the most important. I mean, what's the most important election in the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives? It's the election of leadership, right? And is that based on right? I mean, that and that's is a, a majority vote. 
it's a it's a majority vote of the people who are seated. It doesn't. It's a two-step election process. It's exactly like the electoral college, right? I mean, when when people sit down in the House of Representatives, they don't say, "Well, you know, I won by 60 percent and you won by 55 percent, so we're going to weight our votes that way," right? The Speaker of the House is elected through a two-step process, like the electoral college. Majority leader of the Senate through a two-step process, like the electoral college, right? Those. I mean, every majority vote in the House and the Senate well, is scheduled by leadership who are selected through a system just like the electoral college. It's I mean, it's just, again, I, I can understand why people have problems with that, but it, it calls up a deeper question than let's just tinker with the Electoral College through an interstate compact. <laughs> the, the President of the United States, I think, at least in the public imagination, is someone who represents the people of the country. And they even say about Trump, despite the fact that he clearly lost the popular vote, that he's the President of the people. They don't say he's the President of the Electoral College. And so I think we've got to go one way or the other. I mean, you know, either we, we put him back in his place or any president back in his or her place and say all they represent is the Electoral College, or if they want to be the president of the people, they should go and run in the popular vote. Let me, let me bring up another practical question that keys off the point you made very early on, Congressman, about how it makes uh, Florida uh, recount catastrophe less, like, less likely, and the point you made about how it would create the majority vote rule would kind of create a hydraulic pressure toward a national mm -hmm. administration of the electoral system. One argument that I've seen made against a popular vote system is in the unlikely event we do have a very close national election, then every single precinct around the country has to be recounted and you have this disparate group of abusive, <laughs> corrupt people around the country lo yeah. looking for votes to try to, so that, so that but that's th not their right state because can be... There would still be state election laws and there would only be recounts if it's activated under state election law. But look at what the difference but is if, here. If, the, if, so the, take if it's 2, less 000. than 1%, then everywhere in the country would be activated. Well, right? but th that's true today. If, if you had a 1% result in 50 states today, you'd have 50 recounts automatically. Right, right? but this doesn't have to be one, in every state. It just, the total has to be 1%. Well, right, and, but, and, but that's my point. Okay, so if you go back to 2000, it was a 537 vote difference in Florida, which determined the election. Had the Florida Supreme Court had its way, and there had been a real recount, remember, that was shut down by the Supreme Court's decision in Bush versus Gore, it might have gone the other way. It could have been 500 votes for Gore instead of 500 votes for Bush, and that would have decided the election. If you went to the national popular vote, Gore beat Bush by around 600,000 votes. So it is a law of electoral arithmetic that when you broaden the pool, you are extremely unlikely to get ties and one vote differences like we just saw in that state legislative race in Virginia, um, where you get, you get a tie. So it doesn't make it impossible, but there's a number which is like one over 48,000 or something like that, that you would get something like a tie and you would- I mean, the question you know, is, what is a tie? In a national vote, even, you, might, you might make an argument that 50,000 is, is a yeah. tie, that people would be start recounting everywhere in the country. But, but that's not how the national popular vote works. Because the minute, the, well, the, all, all, all of the states will certify to the National Vote Count Commission what their state vote was under state law, which mm -hmm. is what they do now. Once it's certified, the votes are tabulated and added up. And even if it's close as an election goes for president, like 600,000 in 2000, which I think was the closest we've had, closer than 2016, which was 3 million for Hillary, um, then you wouldn't, it would not automatically trigger any recount. It would have to be a recount in a state if that remained their state law, that mm -hmm. it was so close, and maybe you shift a few hundred this way or that. But this is one of the flaws in national popular vote. It, I mean, not to say it's, it's not fixable, but it is a challenge of trying mm -hmm. to do this through an interstate compact, which is, I mean, it, it, the flip side of that is you could have an election where the winner is clear, but the margin in the state is 0.2%, and so under state law, it triggers an automatic recount as if that state's uh, electoral, you know, as if that state's intrinsic vote was uh, was was relevant, right? Obviously, that's not a feature of this system. That's something that would it's have to change. It's not definitive. Change. It's relevant, it, but it's not decisive. It, yeah. But and and the flip side too, right? I mean, if you have an election, we've had. I think the closest presidential election was was just under eleven thousand votes, um, and that that goes back. A that was ways. a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we've had. I mean, I think I think nineteen sixty was uh, uh, was the closest in kind of the, the modern era. Uh, I mean, we've had elections that are close. Obviously, there seem to be more allegations of fraud today than there probably were 20 or 30 years ago. Oh, I, no. I, okay. <laughs> there are a lot of allegations of fraud. Well, I mean, this latest one, 5 million votes, seemed to kind of take the cake. But, but uh, right. Well, and, and he won. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, 
but, but look, I mean, there are a lot of things in election administration that NPV does not change that would need to change. Uh, I mean, one of the realities of elections is that states issue certificates of ascertainment that actually are their official statement of the, the popular vote results um, that, would, that would be operative under NPV, but they're, 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 not, they're not necessary under the system today. They really should be completed by the time the Electoral College meets in a state, but, but that doesn't happen. Uh, somebody who's doing some preliminary research on this told me about a dozen states didn't do that in time um, for the last election. I mean, th there's a lot of mechanics behind the scene that that NPV, you know, like recounts, like the certificates of ascertainment, right? I mean, the way this would work is you would have 51 state and D.C. election officials who would be certifying the national popular vote total based on their under based on their certificates of attainment sent from the other 50 jurisdictions um, and I mean again you know what happens when you have a big outcry in Texas people saying well don't you can't accept that from Illinois because we saw something in the you know on the TV that said something's corrupt going on there or people in Maryland say you better not accept that certificate of our ascertainment from Texas because we saw that there was some vote suppression there right I mean there's a Partly because this is not uh, this is not a constitutional amendment. This does not actually remake the system, and or it leaves the electoral college and overlays it with something trying to produce, a, you know, an exactly sort of opposite kind of result. Um, yeah, there there are a lot of challenges. Let, like let me squeeze in one more question here. You've been facing. Okay. Representative Raskin, uh, you mentioned earlier that the electoral college might pervert various uh, policy uh, considerations, like the Cuban embargo has persisted. What about other like s structures that we use to select the president, like the primary schedule? Mm. Uh, so the fact that Iowa votes first seeks to leave us with the corn subsidy. Are you also in favor of clean? Yes, subsidy? I'm totally with you on that. I, I think that we should alternate and take turns being first. I don't see why Iowa and New Hampshire, which happen to be demographically uh, very unusual states, should always be the ones that do the winnowing out for the rest of the country. Why don't we take turns doing it? Why not just? Well, but I'm, I'm up for that, too. All of which is to say, none of this is written in the Constitution, much less in the Bible, much less in people's hearts. We can experiment with the way we're doing it so we get a more responsive and transparent and accountable system. I mean, it's really, I mean, New Hampshire gets to be both the first primary, and it also happens to be the only one of 12 small states that's a swing state. So they really get disproportionate attention and more power to them but I think some other small states would like to have the same opportunity. So you are a member of your party? Have you been uh, asking the Democratic National Committee to broker some kind of truce with the GOP to schedule pr state primary elections together well, like you have been pushing legislation for the National As Democratic a member of Congress I don't think I've done anything about that yet but as a member of the Board of Fair Vote I've been pushing that for a long time and I, and I definitely will do that but I think that the national popular vote, I think you're making an excellent point, which is the national popular vote will lead to people trying to talk about how do we modernize our elections. I mean, we're way behind the rest of the world. We're way behind Canada and Mexico, which have these national electoral commissions. All we've got is the Federal Election Commission, which is broken and dysfunctional and only deals with campaign finance. Well, and the so Election Assistance we, Commission that does very The Election little. Assistance <laughs> Commission, which my friends in the GOP uh, have voted to defund. Right. and to get rid of. They want to turn the clock back at a time that we really need to be investing in the electronic security right. of our elections. So I'm glad we can end on something where we, we kind of sort of mostly agree, which is, uh, and, and which should be mentioned in this context, I mean, a lot of the problems that people recognize in presidential elections come from the nominating process. They don't, they don't come from the Electoral College. And uh, I, I would suggest a slightly different solution. Uh, having, having actually gone to, uh, uh, New Hampshire and campaigned as a volunteer for a presidential candidate 18 years ago. Uh, there is something very beautiful about that process, taking some of our most self-important politicians and forcing them to wander around in Dunkin' Donuts in very cold weather. I like that a lot, actually. Um, and, and again, I talked about smallness, right? I, I think the, the better solution, I, maybe, we can, maybe we can build agreement on this, would be to, to simply have a process that starts with the smallest population states and works its way up because, because right, force maximize the amount of retail politics 
that goes on in selecting president, the president, rather than doing it randomly, I mean, that, that actually, if you think about it mathematically, it maximizes the likelihood of every state having a, having a, a role right because because the big states have the most opportunity to have a role if you make them go last mm -hmm. right they still so i i think that's a solution but i'm glad well one caveat to that yeah. is that the smallest population states are not necessarily the most demographically yeah. representative states and iowa and new hampshire are good examples of that i think they've got among the smallest right. african-american populations in the country maybe a little bit better with the latino or asian american population but not much yeah um and certainly nothing like what the national average would be. So, uh, you know, that's another thing that, that we've just sort of um, kind of lunged into or just kind of accidentally or adventitiously, you know, embarked upon. It doesn't have to be that way. And the framers themselves were adamant about this. Um, Jefferson said he deplored the sanctimonious reverence with which uh, some people treat the original design of the people who happen to be founders. And he said, instead of availing themselves of their own experience. Um, the people who wrote the Constitution and set up the original institutions um, were just like us, except they didn't have the benefit of the experiences that we have. And so we know more than they do about our history, and we can make things a lot better. Okay. On that note, I think we have to cut this off. But let's thank our two wonderful speakers. <laughs> really appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. That's Excellent work. Great job. You too. in the atrium for about 45 minutes an hour.